55. Hey everyone, and welcome to day five of Food Addiction Recovery Week on Chef AJ Live. My guest today is Dr. Stefan Esser, and he is gonna be talking about food addiction, concept, conflict, and vitality. And he is somebody that really knows a lot about it, even though he doesn't suffer from himself. I think he really understands the pleasure trap and how people and his patients are affected by it. And I can't wait to talk to him. So nice to see you, Dr. Esser. Chef AJ, thanks for letting me join you as always. And all of your viewers, welcome. So excited to be with you, uh, especially this topic. I know the last five days you had some really remarkable sort of encounters, with different people, both people who struggle themselves, uh, as well as clinicians who've worked with individuals. Um, and I think this is such a crucial topic. So I'm so happy you're doing this this whole week. You know, it's interesting because I know, you know, if people don't know your background and who Dr. Esser, your grandfather was. It's so interesting because right before we came on, we chatted a little bit and I said, I think the way that you were raised, the diet you were raised on made it less probable or likely that you would be affected by this disease. And when I think about some of the doctors that I booked this week, yourself, Dr. Joel Furman, Dr. Alan Goldhammer, Dr. Frank Sabatino, these are all doctors in the, you know, now it's called the, the natural hygiene movement. And I think the way they eat makes it less likely that one is going to succumb to food addiction. Right. As you mentioned, I'm a fourth generation plant-based eater. And I think uh, at the heart of kind of success long-term, I think for any human is just the, the more simple they consume their food, the more basic they consume their food, the less processed they consume their food, the lower the likelihood of addictive potential, right? I, I, I think I've shared on your program previously a slide I had put together that showed, you know, potatoes on the left, French fries on the right, right? Cacao leaves on the left, cocaine on the right, poppies on the left, you know, heroin on the right. And, and just bringing to the forefront this recognition that food, the more heavily we process it, the more the potential to create an addictive pattern. Uh, so yes, uh, I think I was very blessed with the way I was raised with the relationship with food, but even more importantly, just to access the food. Uh, because what was brought into and around my fingertips uh, on large part was food that would not really addict me much beyond perhaps some dates and some dried fruit and a few almonds. Uh, you know, it's very difficult to get in trouble with that sort of food. Uh, so yes, I mean, let's, let's jump right to that, you know, problem solver right there. For those of your viewers struggling with food addiction, part of the answer here is to make getting unhealthy food very difficult. Right. Make getting unhealthy food very difficult and make getting healthy food very simple. Right there in and of itself, you've begun to solve one of the major problems, which is that unhealthy food is almost ubiquitously available, right? Every checkout line, go to Staples. I was at the office store buying a, a little uh, book the other day and I was like, wow, look at all the junk food at checkout. This is amazing. It's right there as though it's like, yeah, you should buy some of this. It's almost like an afterthought. Oh yeah, of course, add that on too. And for those of you who struggle with food addiction, that immediately puts you in a very challenging place. It's like the alcoholic walking up to the alcohol section and be like, oh, no, you shouldn't buy that. It's like, yeah, but I'm an alcoholic, right? I, I can't be in this, in the vicinity. Uh, so yes, that is certainly one of the pillars, I think, of long-term success. Yeah, you know, and you know, you mentioned food like dates and nuts, which have a little bit greater calorie density, but I don't think those foods are addictive. And I, and you know, people say, oh, but I overeat on sweet potatoes or carrots. People don't become sick and obese from overeating whole natural food. I think very difficult to do so. And I think the person, let's say, who transitions from refined foods and foods of animal origin, very sort of addictive, dopaminergic, right? They release a lot of dopamine in their brain. When they go to, let's say, healthier foods, they may gorge on, you know, three pounds of dates. But after a couple of weeks, a couple of months, they're no longer doing that. Because I think the amount of kind of work to consume those foods and then the effects on the gastrointestinal system and all that, right, the, whether because if you ate that many pounds, the bloating, the fullness, you know, this sort of a thing, it's a very different sort of engagement. And I think you get more of a natural moderation of the dopamine release. So as a result, the desire for that hit, right, you don't get that same level of a hit from dates as you do from, let's say, the PEDS candies, right? The little tiny sugary things that <laughs> spike you and there you are. Um, right. And so you don't yeah. get the same diseases either. I mean- 100%, 100%. So, uh, you know, absolutely. 
I think what, what separates the doctors that I mentioned that are on this week is that you're not only eating whole natural food in its natural form, but you are some of the only doctors that advocate SOS free, or I like to call it SOFAS free, sugar, oil, flour, alcohol, salt free, because it, you know, if people can eat sugar and salt and be happy with their health and weight, that's fine. But for a lot of people, those substances make the food more hyper palatable, more addictive. And, you know, a lot of the plant-based leaders say, you know, sugar, salt, flour is fine. And maybe it's fine for somebody with heart disease, but with somebody with food addictions, it's amazing how much easier it is to manage this problem when you do, you know, your diet, gold, you know, it's the same diet. Right, it's, right. It, it, it's so much easier, but the food doesn't taste good at first. They're not willing to give themselves a period of neuroadaptation yeah. and they keep suffering. You know, the, the more you do to your food, the more your food does to you. Right. And I think you bring up a good point there is that two things I heard in that. Number one is I always, I do love that acronym SOFAs. That's a great one that you had come up with and so accurate. Uh, number two is a lot of the doctors who still advocate the consumption of those food-like substances are new to this movement. And so they've read a few articles, they've read a few books, they've watched a few documentaries and they're all excited, but they're not really accustomed to engaging in it for a long term, I would argue. Um, and they're not used to individuals, like you said, who struggle heavily with true food addiction versus just the person who's a little overweight and has a little high, you know, high blood pressure. Sure, you know, go plant-based, even with a little salt and oil here and there, and they're probably gonna improve those numbers. Uh, the other thing that you said in there, right, is something my grandfather, Dr. William Esser, said previously, and this is, uh, so his quote was something to the effect of the majority of Americans are accustomed to their addictions and are unwilling to relinquish them, right? They're so kind of addicted to these foods that they don't want to take on this bad word of discipline, which is such a brutal word these days. People hate to talk about it. I perceive it as a negative, but the reality is in order for you and I to be successful long-term with anything, we have to demonstrate some level of discipline, right? If you want your marriage to be successful, you have to show discipline, right? With your relationships with people outside the marriage. If you want your job to be successful, you have to show up every day, right? And you have to be there and work the number of hours required and whatever it might be. You have to be disciplined. If you want to call, graduate from college, you have to write the papers and do the work. You have to be disciplined. So our health, it truly, as the poet says, right, is our greatest wealth. It is worth the investment. It doesn't all mean that it's all just toil and difficulty, but it does mean that that little bit of discipline on a daily basis is something valuable. So why don't I jump in to our talk? Because I know we're going to be uh, jumping back and forth, you and I, um, with uh, sharing thoughts. So let's, uh, let's, uh, let's get going here a little bit. I want to start with some basics. Here are the basics. You must eat to survive. Next basic, food is information at the cellular level. I love that phrase. Next, some food is not food. Very important. What we eat alters weight, inflammation, survival, and mood. When we put this little basic couple concepts together, I think it's interesting. Number one, food is not evil. Food is not bad. Many people struggle with food addiction, right? They get into that place. Oh, it's bad. I shouldn't have it. I, got, I want it, but I can't. I shouldn't have it now. I've got to control myself. Oh, my God. It's like, whoa, 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 stop. You need food. The desire for food is a very normal response to the behavior of the human. It's for survival. But jump to number three on there. Some food is not food. This is very essential. As you said, Chef AJ, right? The basic stuff, all of those unrefined foods, those are true food meant for human consumption. All of the stuff in boxes, bags, and cans with 20 different ingredients and all kinds of polycarbonate this and blue that and red this, that's not true food. Those are food-like substances. Those are colorful, pretty things, but they're not necessarily meant for your and my consumption. Next is that what you consume radically alters you. At the cellular level, it changes who you are over time, right? Because your cells actually change. Your entire body changes over about two to three years. But it's fascinating to look at the literature on, for example, mood and cognitive awareness. That the foods that you eat radically influence your mood and your behaviors. So as a result, it's this vicious cycle. You feel kind of depressed or anxious or a little out of it. You reach for a food that's going to give you more dopamine in the moment, but that food ends up actually increasing your likelihood of depression. And now we're in this really challenging place. Eat, feel bad, feel ashamed, feel horrible, increase depression, increase anxiety, reach for more of that food. And we're in that little hamster wheel, just going, going, going. 
But these are some basics for us to all think about and to recognize that food addiction, I'm going to say it, it's real and it's also variable. What do I mean by that? Our variability of how severe food addiction is ranges based on our genetics, our environment, our sleep, our behaviors, our stress levels. All of these things radically influence our relationship with the food. So some of you may say, well, I'm not, I don't know that I'm an addict, but gosh, do I have a hard time putting down the Lay's chips? Or gosh, do I have a hard time giving up the diet soda? So you've got this little addictive pattern, this little behavior that you're kind of, again, in that little hamster wheel, but maybe it's not like an addiction that's destroying your life per se, right? In the sense of that you've lost your job, you broke up your family, blah, blah, the way that cocaine addiction does. Maybe it's just some little thing, but maybe it's compromising your health without you realizing it, right? Because we know, for example, the sodas, those who consume the most sodas, right, have the highest rates of, or a higher rate of cognitive decline as they age. So maybe it's not in your best interest. But in addition, I want you to think about this, that your addictive likelihood, your addictive potential is heavily influenced by everything else in your life. If you're getting good sleep, if you're in a happy, stable relationship, if you love your job, if you're getting your exercise, right? All of these different factors will influence how much of the food you eat, how frequently you eat the food, what better, healthier choices you make. So the beauty there is that even if you're not ready today after this talk and after the whole week with Chef AJ of putting down, right, the meatball sub and the three bags of chips and the, two, the full liter of, of uh, soda, maybe you're ready to start making a little exercise decision. Maybe you're ready to start working on your mental health or your spirituality a little bit. Maybe you're ready to go to bed a little earlier because as you make those healthier decisions, they're going to set your brain chemistry up to begin to, A, feel more self-efficacious. Now you succeeded in something you believe you can. So now you might be willing or able or ready to go to the half sub or to a half liter or three quarters of a liter of the soda or whatever it might be that is compromising your health. So I want to get into some top tips for success. The first thing I think that's so crucial for all of us is to evaluate what are we doing? What are you doing? What are you doing with regards to your health? Are you really achieving the healthiest you? And some of you may go, oh, I already know this. Well, do you really, like, do you fully understand yourself or are you making decisions mindlessly, right? So some things to think about with regards to food addiction, do you struggle with your weight? Have you yo-yoed up and down for decades? Can you not stop eating at times? You just sit there and all of a sudden the entire quart of ice cream disappeared. Do you feel guilty or ashamed after eating? If you said yes to any of these, then there's something there, whether a full-blown robust food addiction or just somewhere in the middle, but there's something there. Do you have cravings even though you're full? Do you eat until you're well beyond being full? Do you eat mindlessly? Do you make excuses for eating more? Do you hide eating from others? Like, well, so-and-so doesn't even know it, right? Or let's say your doctor, I see patients frequently and they say to me, you know, I hardly eat anything. Clearly, if they're 350 pounds, they're eating something, right? That is not healthy for their body, that is compromising their weight. So don't quit, right? This is another one, right? If do you continue to eat certain foods, even though you know they're not healthy for you, despite the physical or mental effects. So for example, if you've been told that every time you eat blank, blank, and blank, you become a monster, so unpleasant to be around, so difficult to handle or deal with, and yet you go right back and eat that food again. Or is it you have that, right, the barbecue chicken wings with the sauce, and you always get reflux, and you have this miserable GERD, and yet you go back and you eat more of it all the time. I mean, that's telling you that there is an addictive cycle happening there. For me, I've chosen in my life that, gosh, if I find that I always feel a certain way that is a negative way, or that my health is being compromised, I'm, you, I don't, I'm out. I don't want that. I'm wanting to eat for health. I'm wanting to eat for vitality. I'm wanting to eat for my own wellness. So if you evaluate yourself, which you should be doing every day, and also especially during this week with Chef AJ and all our speakers, and you acknowledge then, oh, there is a problem. Okay, I see it. There is an issue here. There is an issue. That's the first step, isn't it? 
It's okay to say you're not perfect. I'm going to raise my hand right now and just say, I'm far from perfect. I'm not looking for perfection either. I want to be excellent in my health. I want to be excellent in what I do. I don't want to be perfect. But acknowledge if you have a problem. Next, I want you to remember something though. In the midst of identifying your weaknesses, of identifying your imperfections, remember that you're more than your food. You're more than your food. If you find that all day long you ruminate about your food, you think about it constantly in and out, and I shouldn't, I should. And I did it. It's so crucial you begin to interrupt that thought pattern with a reminder that you're more than your food. You're not just that food. You're not your food addiction. You're not your food dependence. You're not, you're more than that. You are the sister, brother, uncle, aunt, hard worker, committed, this, that, whatever, all these other aspects of you. Do not allow, right, your struggles, difficulties, shortcomings, failures, addictions, lack of discipline, whatever you want to say in the realm of food to misdefine you or to universally define you. I remember so well a patient sometime back I had who said, oh, I'm so ashamed. I'm so guilty. I'm so disappointed in myself, right? Because they were about 150 pounds overweight, struggling with hypertension, diabetes, all right? All these different maladies of lifestyle. And yet what's not focusing on the fact that she was an incredibly gifted CEO, a great leader in her company, extremely successful. Remember this about yourself. You are more than the food, but the food must be perceived as part of your success or failure. Why? Because it is the foundation of your health because you require it. And that food will either leave you healthy or it will leave you bankrupt much like a relationship will. It will either buoy you up or it will compromise you. So in other words, I want you to avoid splitting. You're not all good and you're not all bad. The simple reality is that you're human. So you're not always going to be amazingly disciplined or motivated and you're not always going to be gluttonous. You're probably somewhere in between. The majority of us are. But what we want to be doing is swinging that pendulum in the direction that reinforces becoming the person that we want to be. Swing the pendulum in the direction that allows you to achieve the best version of you. It was interesting. I was working out this morning with some weights and I was thinking to myself, you know, that's it. I just want to be the best version of me today that I can be at this age, in this moment, in this time. It was funny, as I was prepping to, to talk with you all today, I was thinking, uh, I had a lot of different concepts I was going to go over. And, and then my wife was reading this book. I'm going to hold it up here. It's called Incredible You, a children's book that she was reading by Wayne Dyer. Some of you may be familiar with it. Um, and I was just sitting working on something else. And I heard her reading this book to the children. And I was like, huh. And so I decided I wanted to use this book and the 10 steps. Yeah. 10 ways to let your greatness shine through as a little bit of a conversation piece for us. So let's walk through those 10 steps and then look at some questions. I hope Chef AJ will chime in with some of these as well. Number one was the following in this book, share the good. Huh. So as you and I struggle with our food addiction, with our tendencies, with our patterns, et cetera, I thought it's good for us to stop and say, what is good about you? Do you have a list? Because you can't always look at all the negatives about you. I'm such a failure. I'm so lazy. I'm so unmotivated. I don't like this. She wants me to do that, but I just, ah, I hate that kale. Yeah, that, I mean, if you're always focusing on what's bad or limiting about you, you won't be successful. So make a list. What is good about you? When's the last time you said something good about yourself? Chef AJ, what's something good about you? I'm kind. I like it. And I'll say something good about Chef AJ too. She's motivated, right? She's been on this show now over a thousand plus days in a row kind of a thing. And why? To inspire and encourage people because of her kindness and love for others. So I would encourage you, make a list for yourselves. What are you doing well in life? What are you doing well? You see, if you can identify some traits, situations, personality traits, things like that, that you're doing well, you can actually use them, leverage them, to help you with your food addiction. So are you using your humor? Are you a humorous, funny sort of person? Can you use that for your best interests? 
are you really good with lists or not? If you're good with lists, hey, how's your shopping list? Hey, do you have a well-lined, you know, you can use what you're good at to help you be successful with overcoming this food addiction. But you've got to first know what you're good at and some good things about yourself. Number two, find what you love. That's what he said in this book, right? Right here, Incredible You. Number two, find what you love. Have you lost sight of that? Are you in a place, a situation, a work setting, a relationship in which you've lost track of what you love? Because maybe that's the whole problem here. Maybe it has nothing to do with the food. It has to do with you hate your life. You don't like who you are and how you're living. And as a result, you're just going for that dopamine hit. You're just going for the dopamine to feel good because you're, you're hurting inside. You know, it's funny. I know people all the time. Actually, I was surprised. My wife went to a birthday party and she came back the other day and she said, you know what? It's crazy. It was a kid's birthday party. She's like, all these people were sitting around drinking alcohol at a birthday party. And she was just like, I was kind of blown away. Like it was a little kid's party and all the adults, like literally they had full on like cocktails and all this. She was like, what are they medicating? Like, wh why are they consuming these food-like substances in that setting? Like, what are you doing that? Like, do you get home at the end of the day and have two or three drinks? Well, why? Is it because you hate your life? You hate your job? You're not happy? Thus, you need to, right? You need to relax. Well, why was your whole day horrible? Can we change that? We've got to find what you love, right? And you have to ask these questions. How do you find joy? How do you find dopamine? What and who makes you feel loved? What and who makes you feel content? I mean, this is actually stuff you should write out. So I have a four week uh, virtual program that Chef AJ is awesome, come, comes to join us every once in a while. And we do this, we work this out. We walk through some of this together. How do you find joy? If you don't have a list of 10 things that are not food related, that are not food related to bring you joy, that may be part of your problem. Because if the only place you find joy, the only place you find this feel good hormone dopamine is in food, you are naturally gonna be attracted to it constantly because we all wanna feel good. We all wanna feel joy. We all wanna feel love. We wanna feel that inside of us. So I would challenge you to make a list. Five, 10 actual things, actual entities. Like I find dopamine in exercise. I find dopamine in looking at nature and being surrounded by it. I find dopamine in teaching tennis. I had find, fun doing that the other day. It was my former life and I was doing it with kids, right? I find joy, right? In my spiritual encounter with God, right? This is so important. You've got to walk through things, right? That you do, that you can do outside of food. You've got to identify these. Number three. From this book, number three, you are filled with love. I thought that was an interesting one because all too often we think of ourselves in a pejorative sense, the negatives, especially if you're struggling with food addiction or other addictions, that you're just filling the negative phrase, right? You are filled though with love. Now, I would caution that as well by saying, well, what are you filling yourself up with? Because if you're filling your cup up, right? With only negative thoughts, with negative media, with negative movies, with negative magazines. I just looked at an article that reviewed some of the internal evaluations by Facebook of Instagram that said that because of youth, because of what they were able to look at with all the data they had, they said that one in three girls who were spending time on Instagram had worsened self-esteem, higher risk of food addictions, and negative food patterns, et cetera. But it was fascinating to see that, so if you're surrounding yourself constantly with movies, the myths represent where health comes from and sexuality and love and relationship and all the rest, right? You're gonna immediately feel unworthy, not good enough, inadequate, you know, et cetera. So if everything you're looking at right now is telling you that you have to be a size zero, size two, no matter what it takes to get there, well, you're never going to be happy, right? Because you recognize, you know, first of all, you're going to be just left with inadequacy, shame, guilt, feeling you're not good enough. You'll never live up to something. And it's a da -da 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 vicious cycle. Now you're dopamine depleted. So you reach for the dopamine rich foods. And there we go. 
So you've got to recognize, right? Get to that headspace where you can look and say, this is not helping me. And this is where you may require a little discipline then to turn it off, to avoid the input, right? So you've got to start looking for those patterns in your life that are you cultivating the garden of your life? You know, every time that you say something about yourself, you are cultivating, you're giving it some fertilizer, you're giving it some water. How does your garden grow? If your garden is not growing well right now, well, it may be because of what you're pouring on it and what you're putting in it. Yeah. So think about that for yourself. What is that self-talk? What are you engaging with? How are you cultivating that garden? Number four, I want you to find a quiet place inside. Now, that was the number four from this incredible you book. Find a quiet place inside. Is it always busy? Is it always chatter? Is your brain always going? Are you constantly working on something, engaged with something? I, I want to ask you this question. Where do you go to recharge? Where is your happy and safe place? In like, who supports and nurtures you? Who encourages you? Who motivates you? Yeah? These are elemental, foundational stuff. You know, it's funny. Many of us with our food addiction tendencies, we want to be out at the forefront right here. All right, let's cut it off. Let's do this. Let's make the change, et cetera. But it's like, wait a second. You don't have enough fuel in your tank to even succeed in the actions you're wanting to do. So I've seen people all the time. They go, yep, I'm going 100%. I'm just getting rid of the sofas. I'm going to start exercising every day. I'm in it to win it. And it, they do amazingly, amazingly for two days, for 20 days, for five days. But then they peter out. Why? Well, because they hadn't built their foundation. They had not cultivated the soil. How many of you have ever grown vegetables? It's a great example. You, if you have inadequate nutrition and water in your soil, that plant, let's say you bought a potted little vegetable plant, right? And you put that potted tomato in. And boy, it takes off. Boom, gangbusters. But you only had this teeny little amount of soil around it in the pot when it was little, and you didn't do anything else for it. Well, it took off. It spikes up bright and beautiful. And then pfft, it peters out. It dies. Right? In the Christian spiritual tradition, right? You have the parable, the classic one of the, you know, throwing seed onto soil where there was inadequate soil. It was kind of sandy, right? Or rocky and it comes up and it just dies off. If you're wanting to break food addiction and this pattern and this behavior in your brain, you've got to make sure your foundation is actually fertile and nutritious. So I would encourage you, right? Before you even say, I'm going to make these big changes. I'm ready to go. But you pause. You back up and you say, how is my foundation? Am I going to have the resources, the energy, the motivation, the support, the nutrition that my little plant needs to flourish? And if not, that's your place. And the problem is for many of you out there, that's the boring work. You're like, ah, oh, I don't want to do this. I want to do that. Mm, get in there. The action. But the reality is, my friends, if you and I want to be successful, our foundation needs to be rich, needs to be nourished. So think about that for you. Number five from the book, make today great. You know, what made my day great today was getting to spend time with Chef AJ and all of you. So thanks for that opportunity. But what are you doing that brings you joy? Last night, I texted Chef AJ a picture. I was at the beach Going for a run, hanging out with my family there was gorgeous. That brought me great joy, getting to be with them in that special place. So remember, you've got to find joy or you will reach for dopamine-rich foods. I think it's also valuable, right? A couple of things came to my mind when I read that phrase, right, of make today great was don't forget how transitory this life is. Every day, every week, I recognize that more and more how quickly my life is passing by. You know, the psychologists say that if you spend all of your time in the past, it leads to depression. Spend all your time in the future, it leads to anxiety, right? And so it's crucial. That's not just a throwaway phrase. It's very important that you and I continue every once in a while to touch this, to go, wow, 
You know, I had a patient, I think they were 70 years of age or something. I forget the other day. And they said to me something I thought was great. They said, you know, I've, I've struggled in my uh, weight for years. I've yo yoed up and down. And they go, but now about three months ago, I decided this is it. I do not want to finish this life out without having achieved the goal of more vital health. And I was like, you go. I was like, that is the most inspirational thing I've heard. And they were, they were down about 30, 40 pounds already. And they were continuing forward. And the mindset was very different than in the past. Like, oh, let's lose the weight for a wedding. Oh, I want to look better for this. Oh, I want to, it was, I want to achieve this for me. I want this to be almost, if you will, their legacy. So I want to remind you, you know, our life will be very transitory, very quick, very brief. We're here and then we're gone. And I want you to remember that while you're here, though, you have a legacy to leave. What do you want that legacy to be? Because the reality is you conquering your food addiction may have nothing to do with you, but maybe it's the best thing that ever happened to the person next to you or the most powerful story and example that happened to the person down the street that allowed them to conquer their challenges. Even if it wasn't food addiction, maybe it was alcohol addiction or sex addiction, or maybe it was an abusive relationship that they were in, or maybe it was just, you know, being kind of apathetic to life in general, and you help them discover the confidence to be able to do their best. Powerful stuff, but you have a legacy that you can leave for others. And that goes to number six in the book, which was change your thoughts to good. Change your thoughts to good. You know, it's interesting. Without realizing it, many of us have thoughts and patterns of thoughts that are just so pejorative. They're so negative. Every phrase out of our mouth is about, I can't, I'm not good enough. I'm not able. Somebody else is controlling me. I did it, so on and so forth, right? The past, the mistakes I made, the inadequacies I have. I wasn't prepared for this. I, okay, 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 right? Which then just leads to anxiety and depression. But the reality is those thoughts can be changed. They are manufactured somewhere deep in our psyche with a combination, right, of the biochemical hormones, right, and the processes that our body is just neuroplasticity has done again and again. So we need to change our thoughts in the direction of good. And it may start with you first being aware of what you are thinking. Do those thoughts and what you see your goals for about, I don't know, four, five, six months, somewhere there, you're going to have to be hyper vigilant, <laughs> very aware of every time one of those little thoughts comes in there. And then you redirect it. And you either say, I'm a, like a little like puppy that's coming into your house. You're like, no, no, I'm turning you around. Go back out, please. No, no, no. You're not allowed in this area. I remember I had a puppy growing up as a kid and we had a big throw rug in the house and the puppy was not supposed to go on the throw rug. That was the whole point, right? And we had these big brick floors, but they could be on that, but not on the rug. And it was fascinating, right? Because as the puppy was trained over time, it learned, right? Because of us going, hey, no, no, right? Or redirection, either positive, right? Or discipline. And that puppy stopped going on the throw rug. It was crazy. He'd walk right up and he'd lay right next to him, but he wouldn't go on the big rug. Yeah. This is how you and I need to be with our thoughts. That thought comes and you say, no, you're not welcome here. You can move along. You can go somewhere else. Yeah. But that visual of, aha, it snuck in here. Or maybe we can take that like a Mr. Potato Head and you look at it, you're like, oh, a big frown here. No, no, let's turn that up. Let's take that off. Let's put a little smiley on. Let's make the upgoing eyes. Oh, that's much better. Right. So instead of the, I hate vegetables, right. Phrase that comes out. Instead you say, well, vegetables aren't my favorite. Ah, see, you just turn that negative to a neutral and a reality. They may not be your favorite. That's okay. You know, the reality is none of us should seek to do the thing that we love more than life itself or like the th our favorite thing nonstop 100% of the day. If we did that, we very quickly lose the luster of that thing. And in addition, right, it may become dangerous or harmful for us, right? So if you skydive all day long, it's actually quite dangerous for you and quite harmful for your spine and your hips when you land. And there are all kinds of injuries that happen from it and degenerative changes. So there's balance that must be found in the system. So it's okay to say vegetables aren't my favorite, yeah? That acknowledges you and your feelings. It's good to acknowledge your feelings, but it doesn't necessarily 
convert to action. The next phrase would convert you to action. You'd say, but I'm still going to eat them because I know they're healthy for me. Wonderful. That is a very rational adult perspective. So think about those thoughts all the time. I'm ugly. And what is this based on? Why are you basic? Who says you're ugly? Oh, well, my ex-boyfriend. Oh, your ex-boyfriend. Well, they're your ex-boyfriend. Should you really care about what they think? Who's a better judge right now of you? Perhaps we can find somebody else. How do you evaluate beauty? What makes you think this is beautiful versus otherwise? Is it the media you're taking in? And so the conversation continues. For many of you, I think that this is so deep, some of this stuff, you may need some assistance, some cognitive behavioral therapy, some EMDR work, a good psychologist working with you, hand in glove, hand in hand with you to evaluate and to engage and to work through it. But I think it's valuable right away because I find my negative thoughts creep in sometimes and they completely sabotage me. They say to me stuff like, Stefan, you're too tired to work on that PowerPoint. Or Stefan, you're, you'll never be successful with blank. Or Stefan, ah, oh, you know, you don't like blank. And I go, if I'm listening to those thoughts, I go, yeah, you're right. I'm just gonna lay on the couch. Yeah, let me go do this. Let me turn on, let me look at, you know, the news. Let's look at this, that, and the other. Let's go on Instagram, whatever. Well, wait a second. That's not helping me become the person that I really wanna be. So in the light of day, in the middle of a day in which you've slept the night before, you're restored, etc., you need to look in the mirror of your life and say, who do I want to be? Am I becoming that person, right? And really evaluate this. Don't do this necessarily late at night when you're fatigued and tired or slightly depressed or whatever it might be. Do this when you're in more of a balanced emotional place. But evaluate honestly your thoughts. I'm going to call some of you out for a moment here too. Some of you are absolutely adolescents cognitive your adolescence, and you don't like to be told what to do. You don't even like to tell yourself what to do because you hate discipline, because you're tired of it, you're scared of it, you, 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 can, you relate it to when you were a little kid and maybe your father or mother yelled at you or your teacher was mean to you or whatever it might be, and you bought into this mindset of like, I want to do what I want to do when I want to do it. But I'm here to tell you something. Sometimes your behaviors and your patterns are sabotaging you, are destroying your ability to achieve the best version of you. And it may be, in fact, that you've got to woman up or man up, discipline up, and actually discipline yourself. You may require that. You know, a horse is gorgeous when it's running out in nature, unfettered, hair, mane, blowing, all the power, the beauty. But if you take that horse and put it in your house and it runs around, it destroys everything, everything. So make sure you are not allowing, right, your perception of something beautiful and powerful and free. Oh, right. I can eat what I want when I want. But in your life, it's destroying you, absolutely destroying you. Make sure you are not losing sight of that reality, which takes us to number seven in the book, which is take care of yourself, right? Take care of yourself. Are you truly doing this? I want to remind you, you deserve to be healthy. You are worthy of health. Even if in your brain it says you're not, you are. But do you know where health comes from? Chef AJ will tell you health comes from healthy living. And that is true. That is rational. That is science-based. Health comes from healthy living. Are you living a healthy life? And do you even know what that looks like? Well, buy one of Chef AJ's books and read about health. Or join my four-week virtual program coming up in September and learn about health and where it comes from and the science behind it. What I, in my group, right, we, we spend some time trying to build you as a CEO. You are the CEO of your own health company. You are the CEO of your own life. There's times where we feel like a leaf just blown back and forth by the chaos of our life. Do not mistake things. My life is chaotic too. My life is challenging too. I have difficulties too. We all do, we're human, and we live in this imperfect world. But the question is, are you treating it all as though you're a leaf and every little thing blows you over there and blows you over there and chaos and conflict and ah, everything's a Kardashian world and I don't know and oh my gosh. Or are you treated as a CEO? We've got some challenges here. How are we gonna engage them? 
We've got some difficulties here. We've got some times come crunch coming up. We've got some employees who aren't working hard. This, this is not working there. How do we make it work? You are worthy of health. You deserve to be healthy. Your company deserves to be successful, but it will require a plan and outline implementation and maybe some discipline. But you can do it. But you've got to believe that your business being successful is worth it. You've got to believe that first. Number eight from the book, picture what you want. Picture what you want. What, when you close your eyes, which I'd encourage you to do later today, not, of course, yeah, do it later today or when you're in a safe place, not if you're driving right now, just listening to this talk. Picture what you want in your brain. So if you say, I'd like to be 150 pounds lighter. All right. Well, what just happened when you pictured that? Did you picture yourself successful on top of the mountain with your arms up? Or did immediately once you pictured it, another picture bounced in that said, right? There was a picture of you actually another 50 or 100 pounds gained back. And the whole image was blurry. And you were kind of crying and inside you were hurting. And, and you were frustrated and angry that you had failed and you had promised you'd be successful, but you didn't, right? So right away, that one image of you, right, was now blurred by another image. So that says volumes about what's going on internally. Or was that image crisp and clear when you said, well, I'd like to be able to do the 5K? Right? I'd like to be able to wear this size pants. And all it was was a crisp, beautiful, in-focus image. This is powerful stuff. If you cannot visualize yourself in crisp, high-definition image being successful, and you're probably, you've got a lot of work to do first before you achieve that. So I want to encourage you to do that little thought exercise later, right? Picture what you want. What does it look like, right? Do you know what it feels like and looks like to be successful at all in your entire life? I bet you do. When you got an A in that paper that you wrote, when you successfully completed high school and walked, when you got the job that you had applied for. You see, you need to use those memories of success as fodder for your garden. It's a little fertilizer that you can pour in there every once in a while. When the brain is saying to you, you can't do it, you're not successful, you're not capable. You need to go, what are you talking about? I did this, this, and this in my life. Yes, I can. I am capable. Because it's a natural and normal human response to find the errors, the imperfections, the inadequacies, et cetera. We're somewhat wired in that negative, pessimistic, anxious way, perhaps part of our survival mechanism, the psychologist may say. But the reality is you've got to use the small successes that you've experienced in order to validate, reinforce, and fertilize your success moving forward. It does work and you can do it. Think about the last time you felt happy or content outside of food as well, because this can help direct you back to what are things that you can do that make you feel joyful outside of food? Are you aware of the things that make you feel happy, that make you feel content, that make you feel at peace? Number nine in the book, everyone is special, especially you. And you are. It's very important to remember that. Saying that, like, I'm special is not some little weird feel-good thing that like, oh, yeah, psychologists say this, whatever. It's a reality. You are genetically unique, never likely to be repeated again in human history. So just at the biologic slash genetic perspective, you are very special. And all of the experiences you've been through, some of them have been horrible. Some of them have been great. They're all unique. But that uniqueness, right, that uniqueness of each of those experiences is what has made you who you are, which is really cool to think about. You are a, a once in a lifetime, yeah? Once in a millennia. So make sure you validate that. And there it is, right? That's why I said that comment right there, that number nine, mic drop, right? Believe that about yourself. And suddenly so many of the other behaviors become easier. Number 10. 
Good thoughts give you energy. I love it. A while back, I read somebody's comment. They said, you know, avoid the energy vampires, you know? And it was like, it's so true. There are certain things that just suck you dry. There are people that suck you dry. There are situations, uh, et cetera. These are real, but good thoughts buoy you up, right? Let's use some fun little phrases. Your thoughts are the foundation of your success. Your thoughts underpin your actions. The classic, your thoughts are the wind beneath your wings. They all are. It's so true. But your thoughts also, right, are the chain that's keeping you on the ground. Your thoughts are also, right, the flat tire on your car. They're, they're the things that can keep you from being successful. It is truly my belief that food addiction at its basis and the majority of ill health related to lifestyle is purely here. It starts here. It's about your belief. Why? I remember so well, this patient a while back lived in poverty, lived in a rough and tumble neighborhood. All right. I shared the med, he came to see me for knee pain on Medicaid. And I told him that he was morbidly obese. I said, Hey, we've got to help you. Here's some ideas. What about this, that, and the other? He came back about a month and a half later. He goes, look, I couldn't afford a lot of the food you recommended, but I did the best I could. I've lost 70 pounds in a month and a half, two months. What did he do? He said, every morning I would go to the gas station and get a little container of fruit. And every afternoon I would go to Panda Express and get white rice and steamed vegetables. Other than that, I had water, right? And some apples. And that was it. His knee pain was all way better. His diabetic numbers radically improved. His blood pressure is pretty much gone. He felt amazing and he continued the process. It was his thoughts that led to the powerful actions. It wasn't even right that, oh, he had a Whole Foods down the road and he had unlimited income and he could do whatever he wanted. No, that wasn't it. He went from a place of victimhood or being lost to a place of victor, a place of victor. The question is, are you and I ready to make that change? Are we ready to be a CEO and not a leaf? If you are, it's time to evaluate yourself. Uh, time to identify your wounds, your behaviors, your patterns. To really evaluate, are you happy? To determine which of your actions facilitate your success and which compromise you. To identify your health and life goals and outline a path to success. This is a lot of stuff. If you need help, join my four-week virtual program in September. Go to estherhealth.com backslash detox and join me. You get daily emails from me and videos twice a week. And I'm here to support and assist you. But the reality is you have got to be ready to get into the CEO mindset and no longer in the slave, the leaf, the victim. I believe you deserve health and I know you want health. So start off by finding joy and meaning outside of food. Make a list of five things. At the end of this talk, go to a quiet place, make a list of five things that give you joy outside of food. Incorporate them more into your life every day. Make it hard to get unhealthy food. If you know that the kettle chips, right, and the hog and dogs are what compromise you, take them out of your home today. Throw them in the trash. Do not put them back in your home ever again. Make it easy to get healthy food. If you know you love papaya, or spring mix, or spicy arugula, right? Or whatever healthy food. If you love berries, then splurge on berries. Find them as cheaply and as healthfully as possible and get them and have them in your home at all times. And surround yourself with people of like mind and keep watching Chef AJ every day. A win, 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 and win. So with that, I wanna open it up, Chef AJ. I know we're getting low on time, so let's talk. Yeah, let me, let me, I mean, this was so inspiring. I always feel like you're more of a minister than a doctor. I'm here to share the message. So Peter says, does Dr. Esser know his name translates to try? Well, eating and being in French, German, and Latin, respectively. That's right. Esser comes from that beautiful Essen, which means to eat. So yes, I love to eat and we all should love to eat but we should eat true food, right? Whole food that humans are intended for. Chef AJ and I can do a whole talk on that another time on the biochemistry and physiology of the human that proves that we're intended, right? 
for certain foods. Right. Somebody's asking for your website. I already have it right below in the show notes, as well as the link to register for your class that starts next month. You're the bomb. Yes, I'd love you all to join me because it's a powerful time. And uh, so, yes, in September, esserhealth.com backslash detox. If you want, please feel free to talk about it a bit more. I know I had the privilege of being a guest speaker a couple of times, but if you want to tell a little bit about what it's in, what's involved with it. Yes. Inspire people well, to join. Last October is when I started it because I recognized that people needed more support and education and information and motivation for a more extended period of time to begin to get these habits situated. And so I put together a four-week virtual program in which individuals get an outline, right, and a cooking uh, list and all of this stuff, exactly what to buy, when to buy it, so on and so forth, how to prepare the food, et cetera, nicely put together for the four weeks. In addition, they get live Zoom calls with me in which we do talks on the heart disease and diabetes and obesity and mood and emotions and label reading, all kinds of good stuff and osteoporosis, et cetera, et cetera. And then they get a daily inspirational email from me with different links. This month coming up, all new emails, new PowerPoints as well, a lot of it uh, as well. I'm very excited. We're going to be sending new recipes every couple of days and even some live cooking demos and things of that kind. So trying to bring more stuff to help you be successful long term and hopefully to have a lot of fun. So yes, very excited about it. We've seen a lot of people with great results. On average, uh, men lose around 20 to 40 pounds. Women lose 15 to 25 in one month. An average, 80% of people get off their oral blood pressure medicines. Uh, 80% of people get off their oral diabetic numbers, uh, diabetic meds. And everybody sees improvement overall in their numbers, vitality. Pain in their joints improves 30 to 90%. Uh, it's, it's fun times. That's great. Um, so Jerry says, do you have any suggestions on how to stay focused on the present when one is in the habit of fluctuating between the past and the future? <laughs> That is a great question. It's a real challenge for all of us. I think you could do a couple little practices. One of them is some form of uh, either spiritual reading, deep breathing exercises, or meditation, each of which allows you to become very present into that moment. Another thing that you can do is five times a day, uh, identify something of beauty or joy in your surroundings that brings you immediately to that moment. And at the beginning and the end of each day, three things that you're grateful for that likewise brings you into those moments, right? So three things you're grateful for, you say them verbally or write them down beginning of the day, five times a day to identify something of beauty, like that cloud right there is really beautiful. That just brought you into this moment, into this engagement. And then an actual set period of five minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minutes of some form of reflection in that moment, meditation, deep re spiritual breathing, reading, uh, centering prayer, et cetera. I find that pets help bring me into the moment. Beautiful. I love it. Yes. You, how's really your wonderful. donkey? He's thriving. Thanks for asking. Could it's he a little, be... little sassy at times, but thriving. What's his name? Roscoe. That's adorable. I think you guys should come on the show together next time. I, I think you should be right here under my arm. We could chat. I, I, think do I love donkeys. They're they're amazing. Oh my God. I'm telling people to follow you on Instagram. I'm putting that link. Jesse has a question that is fantastic. I never would have thought of it and I don't know the answer. So thank you. Does Dr. Esser know how the very first plant-based generation in your family, in his family became plant-based? Do you know the how and the why? Of oh, the of course. Yeah. My great grandfather, William L. Esser was a tailor from Germany and came to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and he had a bunch of health issues. And uh, being a good German, he decided to read the writings of another good German, who was Father Kneipp, uh, a priest who advocated water, fruits and vegetables, and exercise. And he wrote multiple texts and books all about this. And they had what was called the Father Kneipp Wasser Cure. Uh, and I have a bunch of his old 1800s books, actually, that here myself and my grandfather had collected. And so my great-grandfather read these writings and was like, this makes sense. I'm going to start eating healthy food and exercising. And that's what he began to do. Wow. Do you have, do you have siblings? I do. Yes, I have three uh, elder siblings all of who, you know, likewise eat well and take good care of themselves. Wow. So, so it's, this is like a real family thing. Oh, yes. Yeah. So and that's what's so great for those of you out there struggling. You have the ability to put down the flag in the ground and say, it starts with me, right? And you never know how many of your family members and friends will then join, come to that flag. So, you know, it becomes so easy then growing up as a kid, 40, 50 people for all Thanksgiving and celebrations. It's all healthy food becomes so simple, so straightforward. You're not just struggling 
by yourself. Yeah, well, it sure makes holidays easy, doesn't it? Oh, so nice. Yes. Anne says, please tell Dr. Esser, I really appreciate all his prepared meals in Facebook. Did you stop your practice of posting? Uh, no, I was just very busy for a little bit with a few other things I'm working on. Uh, so I'm, I'm putting some back up. Just been crazy busy and hope to get back to more of it. So busy, you can't even get a haircut. No, I know. It's just getting out of control. <laughs> just like me. I feel the same way. I'm just teasing I love you. It. Okay. So um, if there's a question. Um, where are you, Meg says, because she loves the palm trees behind you. I am in Ponte Vedra Beach, Florida. Wow. Beautiful. Uh, Anne says, is the food list sent prior to the start of the program? Are all the meals juice? I doubt you would be a juicer. From yeah, the no, the meals are sent uh, one week prior to starting. So I send them all so you can do all the shopping, et cetera. And no, the meals uh, do not include juice uh, unless an individual says they really want to have, uh, you know, even accelerate their weight loss. They may trade out a juice for a meal one day here or there, but that is not what this program is. This is lots of food, micronutrient dense, whole food, plant-based, gluten-free, salt, oil, sugar-free, a uh, lot of food that's the, you know, to eat. Um, and simple recipes that should take anywhere from 10 to 15, 10 to 20 minutes the most to prepare. Nice. Uh, uh, here's a question from Susanna. When someone says something critical or mean to you, how can you stop ruminating on that? I hate when things steal my joy now that I'm healthy again and feeling so good this way of eating. Congratulations first on a healthy living and a healthy food. Uh, number two is I think uh, a lot of our Unfortunately, the classic phrase of duck off, a, what, water off a duck's back, right? There is some truth to. And I think as you are beginning, I just visualized in my head, you eating well, feeling good, but feeling these sort of attacks or affronts from people. You begin to almost create an ozone layer around you, right, of protection from a harmful concept, you know, words or phrases. So little by little, you may find that you begin to actually build out this sort of protective mindset uh, as people say things and then almost now you have reflective things that bounce back toward them right so it's a little kid's phrase right it's, you say something mean it bounces off me and it hits you kind of a thing uh, you know and so as you're converting more and more to the healthy living you feel better but you're still vulnerable to people's negative comments so number one being aware of those comments number two is if this is someone you love or care about and who loves you tell them that it hurts you just be very vulnerable and say just want to let you know when you said that, that kind of hurts me if you don't mind not saying that. And if they continue to do it, now you know they don't care about you and they're not your friend, right? Or they're completely emotionally insensitive. And maybe you limit your time with and around them, especially for the first six months, one year, two years of your change in lifestyle. But if they're random people out there, don't hesitate to bling back a little lightning right at them, right? So the people who go, oh, you, you're, you're eating that rabbit food, you go, you grab the carrot, you put it in your mouth, you go, yeah, 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 yeah. It's real yummy. You want one? You know, who cares? Joke with them, be silly. Or as I was taught, I love it as a kid, I'd be having my dates and the little kids would make fun of me. And my dad taught me to just say, yeah, it's a dried cockroach. You want one? And they'd immediately stop. So don't hesitate, right? Or to slam them down every once in a while if they're a negative, mean person. And they go, oh, there you are eating that sound. And you go, yeah, you're clogging your arteries and you can't even get an erection. So talk to me later. Oh my like, God, I mean, that's hilarious. Like, whatever. I mean, this is what the science says, you know? So it's just like, if they're a mean, unpleasant person, slap them down. If they're a nice, loving person, tell them it hurts you. See if they change their behavior, right? But yes, we do need to grow a little bit of a, you know, oily surface, you know, the water can just flush off because mean people are always out there. And don't forget, many times they make comments because they feel threatened by you because you're actually doing it yep, and they exactly. should do it. They know they should be doing it, but they mm -hmm. don't have the where with all the discipline, the whatever. So they feel threatened by you, but that's okay. Love them where they are, but slap them down if you need to, right? And don't hold on to the emotion inside because as you said, that's just going to rob you of the joy in the moment right. and of your I, health. Uh, Susanna was recently on the show because she is a true success story, lot, losing 60 pounds. And I think a lot of times when people criticize, it's just because they're jealous. That's right. That's right. Yeah. yeah. And, and that's a good, and, and, and recognizing that is a way to cope with it ourselves. Right. So just go, yeah, they're, 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 you know, or if they're emotionally insensitive, et cetera, dismiss it and move forward. Yep. Fantastic. So Lenny says, can you talk a little bit more about your four week group challenge? Does everybody work in groups? 
So on the program, each individual is kind of their own person, right? Because you have your own privacy. We have created a Facebook group. And so the last month that we did, which was about a month and a half ago, it was fun to see because that group, everybody said, all right, let's all join together on that Facebook group. And they really were very engaged, sharing with each other, chatting, interacting, et cetera. One of our past participants also privately, uh, well, on like my Zoom call said, if anybody would like to you know, form a group on the phone, you know, here's my phone number. And I think several of them did. And so they would have an accountability group together, um, chatting, encouraging, motivating each other. So I'm totally supportive of that uh, for anybody who wants to kind of create more of a network, uh, supporting each other, uh, because uh, that's a beautiful thing to have that additional support. Do you think that uh, being in a group is good for people that have addictions like food addictions? I don't know. I think for some people it is and for others it's not. For some of us, you know, uh, we really learn from each other. We grow with each other. And for others, unfortunately, I think, think using that garden analogy I was using earlier, uh, we have this very vulnerable tomato plant, let's say, and the roots are just starting to grow. And somebody over here dumps some kerosene on our roots and we're not mature enough. Our tomato is not mature enough yet to tolerate that toxin. And so I think it depends on the group you're with, right? And, and where you are emotionally. Some people, I think it's absolutely wonderful, but I almost feel like just like Alcoholics Anonymous, we need to have a blend of people who have been very successful already long-term and then can support those who are just coming along um, or have a kind of mentor, mentee mentality. What do you think, Chef AJ? Well, I think that addiction can only exist in isolation. So I think having to be in a group or not having to be, but wanting to be in a group and being accountable can help a lot of people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, you always ate this way. So like you didn't develop the the taste for some of these hyper palatable foods. Dr. Goldhammer switched his diet. I think he was around 16. Do you think that the longer a person is exposed to these, these addictive foods, the harder it is to break that addiction? Well, neuroscience makes it very clear to us that our neurologic pathways are laid down over time. So the more that we repeat a pattern of behavior, whether it be food, whether it be thought processes, whether it be learning a sport, learning a language, learning the piano, uh, the more it becomes deeply ingrained in our nervous system. So as a result, we should expect the longer that we've uh, sort of engaged in a pattern of behavior, uh, the longer it will take to reformat the hard drive. So 100% yes. Yeah. One of the things I see is the biggest problem, at least at the people that contact me, and I had a consult with a, a, a new client today, is the lack of family support when it comes to food, because the family members, whether they're food addicts or not, whether they're sick and overweight or not, don't see it as an addiction. So they'll tell like my client, my, she said, my husband said, well, you know, because she can't have chips in the house because she goes off plan. Right. And he said, well, you should just you should just, you know, learn to have more willpower. And, and the people that don't suffer from this or the ones maybe that don't care. This is what I see is so hard for people. This the, is the unclean environment and the lack of support. Well, I think it becomes the heart of success, isn't it? Because, uh, you know, if you put, I, I went to college, right? When I went to college away from home and I had unlimited access to all manner of food. I mean, I was in the cafeteria and I was like, wow, soft serve ice cream. I think I've had this once in my life. And I can have three of the, I can have unlimited amount after every meal. And I literally would have like four soft serve ice cream cones after every meal. I remember and, and, that in college, they right. had a machine That's at right. University of Pennsylvania. I know, oh yes. my God. Unlimited pancakes, unlimited pasta. I would just sit there and gorge, right? And I put on like 15, 20 pounds in one semester, right? Until I got sick and chronically congested and I felt horrible. And I was like, what am I doing, right? No, I've got to stop. And I, I, right. And I stopped and I moved on with life because I, right. I could, but my goodness, yes. If you have this food in your house, you're not going to be successful. So that's why I say the people have true food addiction. And the majority of us have some form. Like I said, it's variable levels, but we have some form. If that food's in your house, you're going to eat it. Right. You just got to be honest about this. So even if you don't have true food addiction is destroying your life and you're not 300 pounds overweight. If you want to be healthy long-term, you have to be serious about what's in your house. So the, the little joke I say about, well, the worst thing in my house are cashews, right? Is relatively true because if my wife brings home some all natural baked corn chips or whatever, I'm going to eat them, right? They got some salt. Ooh, these are yummy. I'm really liking these, you know, whatever it might be. So you, you, you have to be serious about this. And yes, if your significant other, your roommates, your spouse, your whatever, is not supportive. It makes it so challenging. But in my group, we talk about how to work through that, right? How to engage that challenge. It can be overcome. It can be dealt with, but it's challenging. 
Yeah. Jesse says, I really have to applaud people who are eating this way without family support. I know very, very few. You know, even Dr. Lyle doesn't keep anything in his house that, and Dr. Goldhammer, same like you, cashews. And he even said, if I go back more than once, no more cashews. You know, I love how Dr. Goldhammer says, we live in a world that's designed to make us fat, sick, and miserable. And some people right. are living in homes and marriages and families. Yes. That yes. are making them fat, sick, and miserable. That's it. And so that first step I said of evaluate your situation, actually look at it, right? Don't just be like ignoring it because it may be for some of you, literally will be that simple. You trade out all of the unhealthy food for nothing but healthy food in your home. And you only go to restaurants for business things, et cetera, in which you can get big salad, steamed rice or baked potatoes. And now all of a sudden it's like, wow, weight's just falling off and you're successful. For others of you, yes, you have deep cognitive wounds. You have deep stuff you need to work through, right? That are pulling you back in repetitively. But for many of you, it's just the environment you're in. Fix the environment, life goes forward, you're done. So absolutely need to start where you can. Yeah. Well, you get me pumped up. I mean, somebody said, this is like going to church and it is, we should probably have you on on Sunday, you know, just to <laughs> and That's then right. I feel more like it. I, I just love the work you do. And I, I really respect all the doctors in your space that, that are on this week, because, you know, many, many people just say, oh, SOS free is too extreme. And maybe it is. However, for people with addictions, I don't really see anything else working. I, and I've worked, I have not worked with as many people as say you or Dr. Goldhammer, but I've worked with thousands now. And I see it unparalleled when you take out all the hyper palatable stuff. Yeah, it takes some time to get used to it. But I know I, mean, I don't want to say I struggle, but I, I have I don't want to say it's a slip, but I consciously let in a little salt this year because, you know, my weight it, it has been fine for 10 right. years. But the problem is, is then when like it was with, you know, that's the thing because I bought it. Right. You know, that it's my own fault. No, it's not like anybody brought in the house, but I moved to a new town and there was a new store and they had this, you know, this salsa. It was like a tomatillo. I love salsa, by the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, when I do go to Rancho La Puerta, there's, I do eat salt because when I travel, I don't really have much choice, but that doesn't mean I have to like have it in the house. So I saw this salsa that looked just like the one at Rancho La Puerta I like, and it's really good. And, you know, Dr. Goldhammer says, you know, when you want to eat something, you, you don't want it to be, you want it to be good. You don't want it to be good. And this was really good. But then the problem, was is I always wanted it. I wanted it of all course, the time. Of course. Yeah. And, 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 you know, and it's not like it affected my weight and it's not That's affecting right. my health or my blood pressure, but I don't like that feeling of wanting something all the time. Even, even if compared to what the rest of the world eats as a sensibly healthy, I don't like that thing, feeling. So I can imagine people that have more hyper palatable stuff all the time, how the banging on their brain must be for these foods. So what I'm trying to say is I know how hard it is and I'm pretty much do, bringing an A game. So Right. I, That's I find right. That, that salt, sugar, and fat are incredibly addictive on their own and more so together. And really, if you really just th want that freedom, that yeah. calm, stable brain, you got to do what, what you say. And, and it's hard for people. I get it. But it's, if you can do it, it, it works great. Well, and the reality is, right, measuring something's difficulty does not measure its value or its worth. Just because it's hard doesn't mean it's not valuable and doesn't mean that it's not worth it. You know what I mean? So it's like, yeah, this may be challenging, but it, it's absolutely worth it. I love it. Yeah. Well, thanks. And we'll have to have you back really soon. Thank you so much. It wouldn't be Food Addiction Recovery Week without Dr. Esser. Thanks, Chef AJ. Oh, thank you so much. Say hi to Roscoe and the family. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live for this very special week. Please come back at 2 p.m. when we have a wonderful story of not giving up Heather Goodwin will be my guest at 